We will get started as soon as we have quorum. I see. Thank you, Council Menard. I see you. I'm leaving. Let's go to the bathroom. All right. We do have quorum. Two online and three in the room makes five. So we will uh, we will continue through our agenda. Did we have to receive the last item, Eric? No? Okay. Then we won't receive it. Um, we held item 6.1. This is the Capital Adjustments for Transit Commission. We had a technical amendment that was introduced by Councillor Brockington at the start of the meeting, and we held it for questions from Councillor Leeper. Councillor Leeper, what are your questions? Thank you, Chair. Uh, so I, I think I'm, I'm just, um, I hadn't seen document one previously. Um, they look like important envelopes. Uh, and I'm just wondering what each is. What are we not going to do in order to transfer these capital funds back over into operating? So what is the station customer information for 1.4 million um, that is now being transferred out of that capital project? And how will it affect that, uh, how will it affect that project? So, Mr. Chair, these are the two projects, three amounts, or three accounts on two projects that are cited in the amendment to the original motion. Um, the two projects that uh, we would uh, ask you to reallocate authority on, one is a large project to uh, put improved electronic information into stations across the system. Uh, there's a, a lot of authority for that. I think it's around eight million dollars. We're not in, you know, as we're on that project and it's rolling, we're not going to spend all of that money in the year 2024. So we have the opportunity to repurpose some of that uh, over into the stage two transition account to meet our training needs in 24. We'll come back to top up for the rest of that project in future years. The second is two accounts related to Lee's Station, where there's a life cycle replacement of some equipment uh, that's needed at that station. The amount that we're uh, recommending to you to move over is money that uh, we would not have been ready to spend in this calendar year. So this is a uh, capital authority that will be able to move over to uh, Stage 2 Transition to support the, the high degree, the large amount of training that you heard about earlier. Um, and uh, we do that just by careful management of the cash flow on these two other capital projects. Where is the top up for the station information project going to come from in future years? Uh, so we would be requesting that, we'd build that into our 10 year capital forecast and we would request it of council in the uh, closer to the year we're actually gonna need it. It could be in 2025, it could be a later year. Okay, and that's, um, that's funded out of tax revenues? That would be part of the future capital budget for that year. So we, they get an envelope for uh, that budget year and it would be included in that budget. Um, so it could be funded from various sources. That one, is, is it a TCA? Cause it's, no, then it would be cash. Yeah. Ca so ta out of tax revenues. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, no, we're obviously making hard choices right now, so I, I get the need. Um, but I did want to understand what we're not going to be doing uh, as a result of the operational pressures that are on OC Transpo right now. So thank you for the, uh, thank you for the explanation. Sorry to keep you here all morning, uh, Isabel. Thanks, Councillor Leeper. Are there any other questions from committee members or councillors? Okay, so let's deal with the technical amendment first. Is the technical amendment carried? Carried, thank you. And then the, um, the report recommendations as amended. Is that carried? Carried, carried. thank you. Okay, uh, we will move on to item number 7.1, focused fair compliance initiatives. Uh, so we have uh, Paul Trebitat and we have Tracy McRae, Chief Special Constable with OC Transpo. 
Uh, they'll have a presentation today. We have three speakers registered, so we'll go to the speakers after that. And then uh, any questions from committee members and councillors. So uh, turn it over to staff for the presentation. Welcome. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I'm Paul Trevitat, Chief Safety Officer for OC Transpo, and I'm joined today by our Chief of the Special Constable Unit, Tracy McRae. And uh, we're here to provide you with a presentation <clears throat> on a uh, focused fair compliance initiative. Next slide, please. Before we begin into the presentation, I just want to remind folks uh, where in the bylaw there is a requirement for anyone using uh, OC Transpo uh, property or vehicles uh, to be transported from A to B within this city that they're required to, to pay their fare. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, just to kind of set the stage here, uh, regular fare enforcement uh, has been a progressive measure over the past uh, year. Uh, coming out of COVID, of course, uh, we've been gradually reintroducing this concept of fair enforcement, um, and uh, steps have been taken um, to enforce the fares using four uh, transit fare enforcement officers. The uh, table that's in this slide just gives a sample from a period of 11 October to the 12th of December last fall on uh, the activity associated with uh, regular fare enforcement that was conducted. And you can see there that uh, there were a total of 287 tickets that were issued. Uh, and that was broken down, or that's broken down uh, with 75 having been issued related to bus uh, infractions and 212 on rail. As well, uh, in the slide, you'll see that uh, the total value of a ticket is uh, $260. Next slide, please. So just a couple of details about fare enforcement. You can see there's a photo there of uh, two of our fare inspectors. Um, the revenue that is generated from the paid fines uh, is collected in a non-departmental revenue account within the City of Ottawa, and there's a portion of that uh, that goes back to the uh, transit budget. Um, the transit fare enforcement officers themselves, they actually receive their training from OC Transpo uh, Special Constables, and their training, um, of course, includes uh, an emphasis on ensuring that the manner in which they conduct their duties, they discharge their duties, that they approach it in a fair and unbiased and respectful manner. And as well, uh, these fair enforcement officers uh, are considered to be municipal bylaw officers, and therefore um, it is under the transit bylaw that they enforce uh, or pardon me, that they are able to inspect fares. So what I'd like to do now, next slide, is to pass the microphone to uh, Chief McRae. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much for the opportunity to make a presentation to you today. Following along with Paul. Um, so as we look at the uh, Focus Fair Compliance Initiative, um, how we've structured it is on a weekly basis uh, where the resources permit. Uh, the initiative consists of two fair enforcement officers and two special constables. Uh, we do use plainclothes officers if staffing does permit on the specific day um, for the initiative that week. Um, so we're focused on transit hubs for bus and rail across the transit system. So this is a citywide initiative. It is not focused in one area in particular because we would like to create a baseline and better understand the offenses that we're facing across the system. Um, the transit fare enforcement officers, as Paul spoke to, uh, are focused on the specific uh, fare compliance and whether or not people have paid for their fares. Uh, that is their scope of work uh, under their union, and special constables fall under a different union. So in order to respect uh, those scopes of work, uh, special constables take on the municipal, federal, and provincial authorities that they have for other offenses. 
So we're looking at this initiative um, and with the reintegration of the transit fare enforcement officers uh, since COVID, we want to understand the, the impact of uh, teaming the two resources together. Um, and we're collecting information on locations, types and frequencies of events, which you'll see in the next slide. Uh, so this will allow us to create a, a baseline metric for fare enforcement activity and approach in the future. Next slide, please. So as you'll see in this slide, the results to date on this initiative, um, we've had five compliance dates uh, already with another one coming uh, tomorrow. So the five days are December 8th, January 5th, 11th, 19th, and 24th. Um, and as you'll see from the statistics showing uh, the transit fare enforcement officers issued 114 tickets in total on those dates. And then as you move through the list on the special constable side for the various offenses, uh, both again, municipal, provincial and federal, uh, the total is 64. Next slide. So the question really um, that I want to bring before um, Transit Commission here is, you know, why is fair enforcement uh, good for, tra for transit? And these aren't in any specific order. They're all equally important. Uh, number one is, uh, is to improve operator safety. Um, you know, many of our bus operators are uh, being injured on the job in the workplace um, because of incidents associated with them uh, attempting to, uh, to enforce the payment of fares before they board a bus. And so, it's, it's important that, uh, that we put an emphasis on this and to ensure that, you know, there is, there is a presence of enforcement there on our system to remind people of the need to, to pay their fares before they board our uh, transit vehicles. Secondly, uh, why it's good for transit is because it maintains our system integrity. So public safety, public security, is improved uh, through bylaw enforcement activities in tandem with fair compliance. And uh, we, are, we are OC Transpo as an organization examining some international best practices for the measurement of fare evasion in, in public transit systems. And um, our targeted campaign, this initiative specifically, is intended at random locations, is really intended to build confidence in the system. And then the third reason why fare enforcement is good for transit is because we want to reattract customers. We want customers to know that they paid their fare and everyone around them as well has paid their fare. And this is important for people to, to feel that, um, you know, there's, there's, there's respect and integrity within the system. As well, this is an opportunity for us uh, to attract additional ridership to improve the prospects for increased revenue. And the third point that I think is really important, and uh, it's, it's around alleviating schedule pressures due to um, ensuring that there are fewer disruptions in the system. And that's a reference back to the potential situation where a bus operator tries to enforce a fare and then a situation ensues as a result. Next slide, please. So as my esteemed colleague uh, mentioned, uh, we are uh, looking at this and in order to do this and in order to achieve our goals, the end result is to protect the integrity of the entire transit system program. Through fair, uh, fair enforcement uh, and as well uh, through the special constable unit, special constables, Public safety is uh, our number one priority, and that is for riders and employees when they're in use uh, in, on, or in relation to any transit property. Um, I think we will improve the prospects of increased revenues with a standardized uh, issuance and standards for compliance. Uh, it'll reduce disruptions in the system. Uh, so disruptions being that when there is an issue and a bus has to stop or slow down, um, you know, special constables are involved or there's a transit fare enforcement officer uh, 
engaged with uh, the individual if it's a fair enforcement, that those continue to lessen and therefore our on-time service continues to rise. Um, improving reliability and productivity, uh, not only on the on-time service, but also the uh, reliability and productivity of our drivers, our operators, our mechanics, uh, and all OC Transpo employees, which will increase the confidence uh, in the ridership in the transit system as a whole. Uh, it will also minimize lost time due to injuries. Um, and this is something that we're working on on a continuous basis. Um, so moving forward, we'd like to bring further information uh, to Transit Commission in May with an update. Next slide, please. So just to, to finish up, uh, SRTD is uh, Safety Regulatory Training and Development is my organization. And there's our moniker there, safety is you, me, and us, and uh, working together, and some additional information there about, uh, about uh, safety within the transit system. So thank you for your time today. Okay, thank you very much. So we're gonna go to our public delegations now. We have three, I think they're all online, are they, Eric? Okay, two online, sorry, two, uh, yeah, two online, one in person. Our first speaker is Nick, Grover, who is online. Good afternoon, Nick. Hey, everyone. Thank you. Um, so, uh, yes, thank you for having me and for the presentation. Um, I wanted to push back a bit um, on the idea that this is an effective or useful revenue generating mechanism. I think there was a lot of celebration over the fact that, hey, we made 75000 on uh, on on fare tickets. Um, this is not even covering the salaries of the fair enforcement officers, and it doesn't come close to the funding gaps that we're hearing about, which are in the, the tens of millions last I heard. So to me, this seems a lot like optics to look like we're doing something when on the fundamental level, um, we're not, and things are, are quite bad. And I think we're also not really asking the question, why are people fair evading? Um, and that's a pretty important question. And I would submit that there's two main reasons in my experience. Um, is The first is that people can't afford it. Um, you know, a lot of people here at council might think that 380 is, is not that much and that people don't really care about fare increases. But um, if you're living in poverty or you're, on, uh, you're unemployed, you're on income support uh, or you're in a minimum wage job, um, every dollar counts. And, you know, uh, it's it's a barrier, and if people need to use the bus, um, we are creating a barrier uh, that's an accessibility issue, and then we also have an equity issue because if we know that people are struggling to afford the fare, and then we slap them with another one hundred and fifty dollars or two hundred and sixty dollars, um, that's a problem. We're we're not not solving anything. We're just adding them with another financial burden. Um, and then there's also the uh, the fairness aspect. A parking ticket is fifty dollars. Why is a why is a, a fair violation ticket so much more? Um, the second big reason I think that people would not pay the fare is that they do not see the service as worth paying for, and that's a problem. And uh, we heard a great presentation today about how the best way to attract riders is with better service. And I think when somebody's bus doesn't show up for half an hour or the train is down and they have to pack into an R one, people are very hesitant to actually want to on top of all of that grief uh fork out you know another 380 or, or or 760 and we have to consider that and and you know i i understand the logic is that well if someone doesn't pay and we punish them we're going to deter people from uh evading the fares and we're going to make more money well paying riders already feel punished by this system that they feel punished every time they get on and it's slow or it's unreliable or it's infrequent or it doesn't show up at all and so I think people are wondering, what the heck am I paying for? And I can absolutely see why someone would not want to pay for this, uh, uh, you know, most days or, or, or even a lot of days. Um, and I think the focus instead of uh, punishing riders and criminalizing riders should be on removing some of these barriers. Um, I think, you know, we have the Equipass, which is for low income riders. Um, it's it's sixty dollars a month, which again I'm sure seems like a great discount. But if people are struggling financially, sixty dollars is a lot of money. 
Um, and OC Transpo in revenue makes 2.3 million off the Equipass, according to their numbers. Um, that's not a lot to offset in, in terms of the size of this budget. I would suggest making the Equipass free so that somebody who is on low income can actually take the bus. They don't have to worry about taking it less or taking it enough to stretch their dollar, or they don't have to worry about getting uh, slapped with a fine if they can't make the fare. Um, uh, as I understand it, fare enforcement officers are paid $4 million, And so that's about half uh, to make a pass free for people who can't afford uh, to get on the bus. And um, I think at the end of the day, a lot of, you know, we're, we're, we're blaming fare evaders for these problems implicitly and explicitly, but a thousand fare evaders could not do the damage that we have seen over the decades uh, to OC transport the budget table. Um, you know, we've, we've been leaving $40 million holes. We've been finding 50 million in cost savings that doesn't go back into the service. Uh, we're seeing echoes of 2011 now with this uh, route review plan. Um, you have to fund the service up front, and there's a lot of ways to do that. I think if you, you know, we're afraid of taxes, but if you tax people a little bit of money and the, the bus service is actually good, they could save a lot of money because they don't have to drive everywhere anymore. And we need to consider that. We need to consider the full picture of, of people's household finances and what they're spending on not having good bus service. Uh, there's also the road widening budget, which, you know, that doesn't make traffic better. Why don't we put that into transit? Why don't we have a better service that saves people money? And then I don't think they would want to evade the fare. And I think they'd actually use it more. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you very much, Nick. I'm not seeing any questions from committee members. Thank you for your comments today. Um, our next speaker is Martin Spielauer. And Martin's joining us in the room today. Welcome, Martin. You can make your way up to the uh, seat at the front. Thank you, Chair. My name is Martin Spielauer. As a preamble, I'd like to say that I rely on public transit every single day. I'm a student at the University of Ottawa. I also hold a job in the downtown core, so I rely on this system heavily, and I have paid my dues with the UPASS. Now, I have to say that I have noticed that the quality of this service has gone down considerably. Uh, this is a service where one in three buses are delayed on some of the busiest routes, um, where the flagship uh, Confederation line was incapacitated for a month um, just last year, uh, and yet a system where the fares are the fourth most expensive uh, in the country. So I think that the report put before us where we uh, uh, cite a reduction um, of 25% to 30% of ridership um, doesn't actually explain the reason as to why ridership um, went down uh, to such a considerable level. And as a transit rider, I can confidently tell you that it has to do, at least in part, with the quality and reliability um, of the service. Uh, and amid that, OEC Transpo has uh, recently cut 74,000 hours worth of uh, service uh, annually, um, while also increasing the cost of fares. Um, so I think that, um, you know, it's fair to say that a lot of Ottawans um, are not interested in using this low quality and yet expensive service if they have other options. But um, this measure, unfortunately, touches people who have no other options but to take public transit. Um, and the reason that I chose to actually come to speak here today is because yesterday um, I witnessed an interaction between uh, an OC Transpo uh, fare inspector and an individual who had not paid their fare. Uh, it was not a particularly friendly uh, interaction. Um, the fare inspector had no regard for making the interaction uh, less public, uh, and I can't describe it as other than uh, a public humiliation, quite frankly. And um, myself and other um, Riders uh, felt uneasy and, quite frankly, unwelcome on the system, despite uh, having actually paid our, fa our fares ourselves. So I'd like to contend with the idea that uh, this makes uh, transit riders feel better or that it encourages people uh, to use transit. In fact, uh, it makes a lot of people feel unwelcome. Um, but with that being said, as uh, was mentioned by the previous speaker, I think that it's also important to uh, acknowledge, and I would urge this um, commission to acknowledge the reasons as to why uh, someone might skip a, skip a fare, many of which I know personally, uh, people from low-income backgrounds. 
Um, and I think that it's inconceivable to find them, find them $260 when the fine for um, parking in front of a fire hydrant, which openly uh, endangers the lives of people, uh, costs or sets you back 100 bucks. The fine for illegally parking in front of a hospital sets you back maybe $70. Uh, and in many cases, speeding through a community safety zone uh, could, uh, in some instances, set you back less than $200. Um, so I think that it's misguided to try to close a multi-million dollar deficit um, by charging low-income people who already cannot pay um, these fares. So I would like to... Um, really urge this uh, commission to reconsider these measures. Um, it is outlined in uh, the report that um, there's not a lot of money to work with due to these deficits. Uh, and I think I speak for many transit riders when I say that we would much more appreciate that uh, already limited resource, uh, those already limited resources be put towards improving the service um, instead of making people feel unwelcome on public transit. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions for our delegation? Thank you, Martin, for joining us in person and, Thank you. and sticking around for, uh, it's been a long, long day. Thank you. Okay, our third delegation is Shana Kainel. Shana is online, I think. Yes, good afternoon. Bonjour, merci. Uh, je me présente, je m'appelle Shana. Uh, I'm je Shana. I live in Somerset Ward. I'm the co-president of the Climate Action on campus, uh, so I'm aware of uh, the importance of uh, of uh, public transit to the city of Ottawa it seems determined to make citizens' lives more difficult, especially those who use public transit. Uh, we're seeing cuts to bus routes. Uh, and we're seeing the service get worse bit by bit. Uh, in Ottawa is now the fourth most expensive uh, system in the country. Some cities can justify the price of tickets. With a reliable system like in Toronto, Ottawa, because buses are continually late, breaking down. The sound is really unacceptable for interpretation. Now, the city is spending $4 million on enforcement officers currently instead of improving the system. So what the city is doing is prioritizing uh, travel by cars, and people are being turned off from using public transit. Uh, now, the fines, uh, the fines uh, for parking in front of a hospital is only $60, uh, and uh, using a bus lane is $75, uh, but a fare contravention is now $260. This shows really that uh, it's more important uh, for Otto, Otto, the city of Ottawa to uh, punish uh, people uh, for not paying their fares uh, than to encourage them to take uh, public transit. So what the city is doing really is uh, fostering the use of cars. Uh, so my question is, how can you justify such high uh, fines, uh, which has such a negative impact uh, on people, especially poor people, uh, when there are other measures that you could be taking to improve public transit. Uh, how can you justify the cost uh, of uh, the fines? Uh, others uh, have mentioned, or in the presentation it was mentioned, uh, that uh, we have to make sure that everyone pays their fares, and that would increase the number of people using public transit. I have never wondered uh, whether other people around me have paid my fare. It's never influenced my decision to take public transit. Uh, so I think really it's really a very strange uh, statement to make. Uh, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Shana. Est-ce qu'il y a des questions pour notre délégation aujourd'hui? Thank you, Shana. Any questions? Uh, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, we'll now start to uh, continue with uh, questions for staff. Start off. Councillor Carr, you're first up. Thank you very much to those that made the presentation, and thank you, Chair. 
Um, I do have a couple questions. The, the first question is, do we have any idea of how broad fare, fare evasion is across the entire OC Transpo system? Like what percentage we're dealing with um, on both? Obviously, I've noted that there's far more tickets issued on rail than there are on buses, but do, do we have any idea of the percentages of fare evasion based on what you've, you've seen or any evidence other than anecdotal on, on uh, what it would be like? I have more. So. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Chair. I'd like to call upon my colleague, Pat Scrimger. Thanks, Paul. Mr. Chair, uh, no, we do not know. Um, we, we do know that there are some. We know more uh, at stations that have fare gates than we do on, on buses or at station or uh, at transitway stations. But um, responding to uh, an audit from several years ago, uh, well, the management response to the audit was that we are uh, doing work to uh, develop methods that are aligned with international best, best practices on how we can estimate the number of people uh, who do not pay a fare. Okay, thank you. So just uh, on your question, you're saying that there's more fare evasion where there are no fare gates? Like, if there were 75 tickets issued on buses and 220, 212 on rail at a certain time, like, are we more likely to see more fare evasion, for example, at Herdman, where it's easier to enter the station? Are, are you seeing patterns in that at all? Um, uh, Mr. Chair, no, we, we don't know that. And I, I think, you know, we can suspect things like that, but we don't know the answer to any of those yet. Um, we know that most people who ride on transit in Ottawa have a monthly pass or have a, a U pass, and therefore most people have prepared their fare already. So just observing someone who gets on the rear doors of a bus without tapping their pass doesn't necessarily mean they haven't paid their fare. So we've got more work to do. At the, at the uh, O-Train stations, it is easier to, to tell the difference because someone either gets through the fare gate by having uh, tapped their card or, or tapped their transfer or they push their way through bodily and um, you know it's, it's easier to, to tell the difference. Uh, but we've got to develop a method that allows us to estimate fair payment and non-payment um, at all types of bus stops and all types of stations on all types of vehicles across the complete system. Okay, thank you. So you look at fair payment and non-payment. Is there any look being taken at underpayment, for example, at an LRT station when you use the self-service kiosk? I could buy myself a senior's ticket even though I'm a couple years out. Like, is there any look at that? Do you look at that at all? Uh, yes, yes, we, we will, we do. And uh, wherever possible, we take structural uh, steps to reduce that. Uh, ability for people to purchase a discounted fare they're not eligible for. Okay, thanks. Now with, so there's four fare inspectors and then special constables that accompany them. Did I understand that correctly? Because the, the, the fare inspectors inspect the fare and then the special constables have the authority to issue the ticket, right? I, so four fare inspectors, did I get that right? So we have four transit fare enforcement officers. Um, for this initiative, we are uh, coupling them uh, as a team to work together on the initiative. Uh, for fare enforcement on a daily basis, they are uh, working in pairs and out on their own doing fare enforcement specific. If they require further assistance, then they will call upon us. Okay, so on a certain route where there are fare enforcement inspectors, um, what percentage of fares would be, like on a bus, if you're at a station, like what percentage of fares are being tra tracked about like 3% or do you have any idea? I don't have that number today. Okay, would, because the fares get the fines, like they go to an account that is not, you get a small portion, I understand. Um, would transit have any idea what percentage of those fines are actually paid or no, that goes over to provincial offenses, does it? And we have no way of tracking that? That's correct, Chair. The, there's no way of actually knowing which dollar is attributed to which offense. It just comes into the account from okay, the province. So, from the province. 
Okay, yeah, perfect, yeah. No, I, I heard some comments that it was to close the deficit, but it, it goes to a completely different account, and that's not one of the objectives of the, the program whatsoever. Um, okay, and then just with respect to when you're inspecting fares, like, do you track the percentage that are underpayments or expired or any of that, or are you simply more looking for people that haven't paid at all? So the focus is on uh, fair compliance, so their, w their unwillingness to pay their fare at all when they're boarding. Okay, excellent. Okay, I have a few more, but I'm going to go to someone else and see. I bet you they'll get asked. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Councillor Menard. Thank you very much, Chair, and thanks for the uh, presentation from city staff. Just a few questions to, to follow up on, on this item. Um, in relation to some of what the delegates were, were asking. The, I understand there's a separate provincial account that Councillor Carr was also referencing. Just on the, the basics of it uh, though, the, the fines that we would levy or uh, that, that residents would be paying for uh, not paying a fare, those, those fines specifically wouldn't cover um, the cost of a fare inspector salaries, for example, that's fairly I think obvious from our numbers. Uh, thank you for the question, Chair. There's, there's no, uh, the objective here is not to achieve a level of cost recovery. It's, it's more about right-sizing the amount of effort to create the level of deterrence that we feel is necessary to protect the integrity of the system and assure some level of public safety. Yes, I understand uh, your your goal in that. Uh, but just to clarify, the question I asked was those fees levied would not cover the salaries of, of those fair inspectors. That's fair to say. The fees are not collected by OC Transpo. The fees are collected by the province and the money is transferred to the city of Ottawa's non-departmental revenue account. Right, so I guess, and I understand that. Um, I'm just looking at the numbers from 2023 from May to June and the total cost of our fair inspectors at that time was $85,000 that we paid in salary and the collection was only $8,580 uh, in fines. Now I understand the revenue generated from paid fines <clears throat> goes to the province of Ontario and into a non-departmental account. And where I'm going with this is that we receive a fixed allocation of $2 million, fixed allocation, I understand that's year over year, from the non-departmental penalties and interest revenue account, which goes towards transit services in general, is not specific to paid fines. So, so that if we, for example, had just one fair enforcement officer instead of four, or we had 10 instead of four, would that $2 million that the city of Ottawa receives differ in any way, or is it contingent on us having a certain amount of fair inspectors as an example? Um, thanks for the question, uh, Chair. <clears throat> I really don't have an answer to that question. I apologize. I, my understanding before the pandemic, we had considerably more transit fair enforcement officers. Uh, coming out of the pandemic, we, we have four. Um, is it the right number? Should we have more fair enforcement officers? I don't no, know. No. Sorry, Chair, that's not the, I just, I guess the question is, I just, Chair, if we can just focus in on this. We received $2 million from the province under that general account. Does that number change based on the number of fair enforcement officers we have or the fines that we levy? Or is it a static number we receive that regardless? Chair, the answer is uh, the two million is fixed, no matter okay. uh, how many uh, fair inspectors we have. Okay, thank you. That's very clear and I appreciate that, uh, Madam GM. Um, I wanted to ask about the 2019 Auditor General's report. Um, that stated and recommended that the city should determine how a system-wide fare evasion rate should be derived. 
We had some delegations speaking about the cost of fines compared to say like a parking ticket or otherwise, and how much more it is for, for fare evasion than other tickets in the city. Management agreed with the recommendation of the Auditor General that the city should determine a, a citywide fare evasion rate, um, taking into consideration the practices of other transit agencies. Has that recommendation been completed by, by staff yet? Chair, I know that uh, my, my team is working with CUDA to have... Uh, um, to, to address that. It's not something, it's, it's not very easy to do so because I used to say, we don't know what we don't know, right? We don't want to say that it's 2% where it's 15%, uh, and we don't want to say 30% where it's 5%. So that's why we need a common uh, agreement with uh, other transits to make sure that we can evaluate that. However, the, the job that uh, 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 Chief McCree and uh, Paul Trabutat uh, are doing now, th those jobs will help us to see uh, what, what kind of issue we have to address now. And what we see with those two uh, exercises, the problem is, is, is very important and we have to address it to minimize uh, the, the fair evasion. Okay, I uh, thank you for that, um, Madame Al Carmen. I, I would just say um, that we really do require some estimates for the overall financial impact of fare evasion and the effect that regular fare enforcement may or may not have on the rates of, of fare evasion. Um, and also, uh, there's a question of fairness with regard to other fines levied in the city for other um, behaviors, like such as not paying a parking fee, for example, um, and the comparison and the fine that we levy for those sorts of activities. Uh, I think further to that, there is some potential cost benefit analysis that um, OC Transpo should be doing with regard to that $2 million fund that we receive, regardless of, of fare inspectors, and, and whether or not there is potential savings for the city uh, if that is going to be re received, regardless if there is 10, 12, 1, 3, 4 uh, fare inspectors out there, um, there needs to be, I think, some analysis on that side as well um, in terms of determining, you know, a path forward on this. And I'm sympathetic to some of the delegations that did talk about the, the difference in fines and the ability to pay uh, for residents that are taking transit um, and, you uh, and that consideration. So I appreciate the report today and, and I hope that the Auditor General's recommendation from 2019 is followed through upon and that we get that information back so that determination can be made in, in those other regards. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Councillor Curry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just following on that exactly. I think that's very simplistic to just look at it straight money for money because the reality is, and let me tell you that Councillor Carr and I sit in on the uh, program and services working group. And we heard directly from the transit union and the bus drivers who told us that money or not, saved money, cost of fair uh, officers or not, the reality is they are completely demoralized by the situation that they, they experience every day, all day on the job, where people walk on and laugh at them when they ask for them to pay. And they have to deal with that type of behavior and then eventually just give up. And they explained it to us in very clear language, exactly as I'm telling you right now, that the cost of that, the level of how much they are demoralized and how much then they don't want to do this job anymore uh, is another cost, right? So what is that cost? And so, you know, as I said, you can, you can look at this and say, oh, how much did we get after we implemented this program? Oh, how much was it worth? The other thing that they told us very clearly was that our estimates, whatever they are, if they're guesses at how much we think we are we are missing out on, are way off in their opinion because they are experiencing it every day, all day. And they're saying it is significant. They weren't saying, oh, you know, I think we could get a few more, you know, $100,000. They actually indicated millions. So, I mean, I just think this is something we absolutely have to do. The other is the deterrent factor of people who can pay for the fare who then say, well, there's no fair uh, officers here. There's no um, special constables. I'm just not going to pay, even though I can pay. But knowing that there is someone there or that they may be concerned, they will pay. 
So these types of things, I, you know, they're very difficult to measure. I'm not indicating, oh, this is just simple. We know we should be able to figure this out. But I'm telling you, these are real stories from people who drive our buses every single day telling us they think this is one of the number one things we need to look at. So I do want to make those comments on behalf of the union members who spoke to us. The other thing I want to ask is, do we know how much our fines are compared to other cities? Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, yes, we have some of that information from some of the cities across um, the country. I don't, I don't have it here, but uh, if there's a, a question for us to follow up on, uh, we can do that. We, generally speaking, um, we're in the in the same ballpark if we compare what the the fare for non-payment is as a ratio to uh, the price of a monthly pass. Okay, great, thank you. And so, is that how we decided? I know someone sort of asked this question as well, but I wasn't sure I got a clear answer. Like, how would we actually determine it? I know that was part of the AG's report. But is it based on that, that it's um, the cost of a monthly pass is what we think is adequate? Or how do we actually calculate what the right fine should be? Chair, it's the province uh, who calculate that uh, fine and we apply it. Okay. So we can't just say, oh, well, we think another fair, another fine is different or whatever. I mean, in, in fact, this is theft. And I'm sure that there's some consideration given to what the actual, uh, you know, action is this is an actual offense to, to be stealing from someone else right it's like shoplifting you're actually stealing um so i uh i i hear what people are saying in the delegations i really did i listened carefully i just find it very difficult for uh us to be sitting thinking uh it's okay for people to be breaking a law and we should just allow it to continue because of different reasons i mean it's, you know, if people sneak into movie theaters, you know, there are movie theater staff that that get on that right away. And, you know, believe me, kids do that all the time and they need to be treated differently for sure when they're talked to. But you can't just allow this stuff to go on with doing nothing. So I will say that the recommendation by the unions that spoke to us was that there be many more officers, many more. And they don't think the, the number we have is enough. Anyway, those are all my comments today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. OK, Councillor Leeper. Thank you very much. I really just have the one question, which is, do we know who is being fined? Uh, Chief McRae spoke in her comments to, you know, fair enforcement. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing that fair enforcement officers probably ask um, affluent riders uh, for proof of payment as often as they ask people who don't look affluent. But who actually is evading fines? What is there and being um, and being fined? Do we know anything about the demographics? So at this time, as part of the initiative, as we reintegrate the uh, transit fare enforcement of officer program, uh, we are that is part of the initiative is to establish the baseline. Uh, what demographic are we looking at? But when you do speak to uh, the transit system as a whole, I mean the transit system as a whole, which means the entire city of Ottawa. So they cross uh, east, west, north, and south. So the, it is a broad range, um, and it does affect everyone. So, and it's not, uh, it depends on the station. The, de the demographic will depend on the station that they're at. But do we, do we know, do we have data on household income for people who are being fined for fare evasion? Not at this time. Because my assertion would be, until proven otherwise, is that the people who are getting $200 fines are largely some of the poorest residents of the, neighbor, of the, of the city. I would suggest that fare enforcement very specifically affects the city's most vulnerable residents. We can ask for proof of payment from everyone, and that sounds like fair and equitable treatment, but the actual impacts of fair enforcement are probably falling very disproportionately on the lowest household income residents of Ottawa. And I, I, I know I, I take this one personally, and, and, and forgive me, one of the most humiliating nights of my life was probably about, I don't know, 35 years ago. 
And I was a student, my partner at the time was uh, working retail. And I mean, we were at the point where we're collecting dimes, dimes and nickels to pay our bus fare. She worked at Bayshore, we lived downtown. And we're collecting dimes and the operator didn't accept the dimes and nickels. We didn't have the bus fare to get her to work, right? Bus fare is not something that is just anyone can pay. And transportation, Councillor Curry, is not a movie theater, right? You need to be able to get to work. We need to be able to rely on our transit service. And yet, we treat it like it's buying a box of popcorn and a movie in which everyone has to pay. I don't think targeting our riders with fair enforcement blitzes is fair to the most vulnerable residents of Ottawa. I know we're going to have really serious differences of opinion in, uh, on this council around that. There's a lot of sort of Old Testament, I got to pay, you got to pay. But I would love to have some demographic data to inform our discussions around this. Who is really affected by fair enforcement? Because I'm going to suggest that until proven otherwise, I don't believe it is the affluent residents of Ottawa. I believe that fair enforcement particularly affects the most vulnerable residents of Ottawa. And, and when laws affect the most vulnerable disproportionately, that's when we start moving into unconstitutional territory and courts start striking laws down. Because that's not a fair and equitable society when we have laws and enforcement that specifically target the most vulnerable. Um, so thank you for your answer to the question. Uh, I would look forward to seeing if there is a literature out there on this. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm not pleased to see that the city of Ottawa is, is taking uh, special measures to enforce fares on our transit system. Did staff want to comment on that or not sure it was a question specifically? I think that data would be interesting. I, I think we should be cautious though about assuming yeah. without that data about who might be evading fare. Anyways. I, I, until proven otherwise, right? Uh, and I'm going to suggest that sure, there are probably some um, uh, better off people out there who evade fares, but I would love to see the data on who's actually getting fined. Council Brockington. Let me tell you who I witness. When I'm at Rideau Center and I stand and I watch, I see gobs of people with expensive bags huddling together, one person taps, and groups of friends go together. And they've just spent hundreds of dollars at the Rideau Center. I'm at Parliament Station at large events and I see throngs of people trying to, to beat the fare or people wait until someone taps and they, they piggyback on them to go through there. I, I get on articulated buses and I see very few people tapping when they get on at the back. These are people who have a bus pass, uh, maybe they're paying per ride, but um, I think to the, cons or to the um, chief's response, they ask everyone. Everyone has to be asked whether they paid or not. They certainly don't target people but I do think data on, on who's getting tickets helps better inform us about fare strategy. That's why we have nine fares. That's why we have free fares for kids and discounted fares. That's why we've frozen uh, Equa fare and Equa pass for a few years now because we acknowledge some of the economic hardships that some of our residents are under. So I, I, I understand that, um, but you know, I've, I've heard over the years, delegates say only poor people take OC Transpo. That's not factually correct. I've heard that uh, people who take the bus have no other transit means available to them. That's not correct. Some people who take transit are poor. Some people who take transit have no other means. But even some of the delegations today have these very generalized statements about who takes transit and why they take transit. So. Every time this, this issue appears in the media, people who claim to be taxpayers in my ward are upset because they don't think OC Transpo is doing enough to make sure that the revenues that are lost, uh, you know, that we don't have some controls on the revenues that are lost. 
And we also hear from, from advocates who are concerned about the less fortunate, about the direct impact this has on them. And I think it's a fair comment as well. But, um, you know, the union delegated or presented, I believe, at our last meeting, and this was one of the issues that they raised. And it's not fair for operators to be the policemen or police women to enforce this. I think you ask once, and if there's uh, not a positive reply, you avoid a confrontation. But ultimately, it, it relies on our constables to enforce fair aversion. And um, I don't want it to be a revenue source as well. I want it to be a deterrent. I want people at the back of their heads thinking, gee, if I don't pay today, I hope those constables don't come on. And the one and only time I got nailed, I was in Europe uh, just before Christmas, and uh, my transfer had expired. And sure enough, I'm on the trolley, and the fair inspectors come on, and I get a ticket. So uh, I didn't understand what the ticket meant in Hungarian, but I obviously surpassed my allotted time and had to pay on the spot. So um, for me, it's not about the revenue. It's about we have to make sure that it's a deterrent, that our operators are not being attacked and assaulted for trying to enforce the fare for people to get on. And for people who can't legitimately afford the fares, we try and offer a different fare menu or options that people who qualify can tap into that. So that's my thoughts on this matter. Thank you. Councillor Tierney. Great, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, I won't get into discussions about other councillors' opinions because we all have our own opinions and we shouldn't be afraid to express those. Uh, so I'll be uh, to echo one other councillor's comments about the presence of these officers alone means a great thing for our community. And I'll give you a very prime example is you look at the Gloucester Centre, and I know. I see some nodding heads because it's not only a police issue, uh, we also have some, um, uh, some other issues that require our special constables where that mall that used to be th pretty much th thriving, some older shops in there, but a, a thriving spot. Uh, now, a Walmart has closed their entrance uh, through the mall into their store uh, because people, and uh, a lot of them are kids, granted, uh, are grabbing uh, small appliances off the shelf and running out the emergency room, emergency exits directly to our train station at Blair Station. And when you're a passenger on that train, and I hear the reports all the time, and between the police service and you guys, as a deterrent, being on that platform is starting to help. But when we weren't collectively getting together, um, people were nervous about getting on at Blair. They were, they were seeing kids running on with like a blender or something under their arm that they just ran out of the Walmart. A dollar store uh, that's in there closes their gates at lunch because there's so much theft uh, from schools locally uh, that are coming in, grabbing some energy drinks, jumping on the train and heading back the other way real quick, like a big pallet of... It sounds minor, but for residents that are taking it or customers they get nervous the liquor store in the same parking lot they had over 178 thefts last year they grab the booze they jump the the they go through the bottom part to get into the train service and they're off headed downtown so we having the presence having boots on ground which i've always supported i continually support and i want to thank uh, your special constables i know quite a few of them uh, that have to deal with a lot of things that typically don't have to be dealt with. I know we're talking fair evasion, but the bonus out of this is, like we were saying, this isn't like we're, it's not a tax grab. We don't want to make it a revenue generator. We want to see bodies and badges uh, to make the riders feel safe. The washroom at Blair Station, many incidents uh, go unreported, many. But our special constables are there to contain the situation. They shouldn't have to be, but that's the world we live in. We see store thefts all the time, and transit is their prime point to hop on and get out, uh, as well as a lot of the situations that take place at those terminus nodes like Blair Station. So I'll certainly be supporting seeing more badges uh, on platforms for sure. So thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Councillor Johnson. 
very much, Mr. Chair. It's been a very interesting conversation. Um, <clears throat> so if I might offer a, a, a different alternative or a different outcome, I think what we're, we're suggesting is that, or what I'm hearing suggested is that the fair compliance officers acting as deterrent is to try and institute a behavior change. We're looking for a behavior change of people to pay fares. I, I think that's what I'm hearing. Um, and so I do wonder um, to what extent we are collecting the data on the type of people that are evading fares. That would be the driver for understanding um, other ways that we might support their behavior change. Uh, if we don't have the data for those individuals, we can't have a holistic understanding of what needs might present um, for them to be compliant with our expectations. I appreciate that, you know, we certainly have rules and everyone should follow the rules. But I mean, <laughs> um, I've broken rules uh, and I know what they are. I think there's other reasons that we all come to the table with with our with our behaviors and and without the data, we don't. We don't want to end up in such a degree. Like, I mean, I, I, I'm hearing that it's not a cost recovery model, but certainly we don't want to get to the point where we're uh, throwing good money after bad for the actual behavior change that we're after. So we do need to interrogate the data a bit. I think what I'm also hearing is a very a, a difference between the special constables and the fair compliance officers and whether or not we're asking for different kinds of behaviors for those different roles. I hear with you know, Councillor Tierney's comments, certainly those special constables have a, a monitoring and oversight of behaviors on the platforms that we don't necessarily have otherwise. In some of the other parts of this conversation, we're talking about fair compliance. So I think just making sure we have a distinction in our approaches for those two roles will be important. Um, I, I, I know many of you know, but I used to work for an affordable housing landlord um, that had field staff. And I continue to use this example whenever we talk about uh, anyone who is a City of Ottawa employee who is technically in the field, whether that be public works officers, whether that be building code inspectors, whether that be now perhaps fair compliance officers. Each of these individuals are a touch point. They are a touch point between our residents and the reputation for the City of Ottawa. And so we, as their employer, should be supporting those interactions with residents. So when I hear one, um, one of the delegations suggests that it was a combative or an aggressive altercation. I can't imagine that that fair inspector was feeling supported to have that conversation in a, in a productive way. So I wonder, you know, what kind of support are we offering to those guys so that they're not getting into a pinch point? Um, do they have the empowerment to, um, you know, as they're issuing a fine, educate those about the Equipass and Community Pass offerings? Is that something that those fair compliance officers would do? Do they enter into those conversations with residents? That's a question for staff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just in answering that question, um, so there's a, a, there's a couple of pieces uh, to that. Uh, yes, uh, education is absolutely uh, a very, very important piece of what we're doing uh, when it comes to fair compliance. Um, I always encourage uh, my officers, whether they're special constables uh, dealing in a criminal matter or the transit fair enforcement officers dealing on a fair issue, if it's identified that the individual uh, is in a place where they may not be able to afford it or they are having uh, other types of issues, that we introduce them and offer them uh, community programs. There are programs out there that offer free bus passes there are programs out there that offer reduced passes uh, and allows them the opportunity to take transit and not have to worry about attempting to fare evade. Um, and in gathering the statistics as we move forward and bring this back to a transit commission, uh, we don't have a way to determine financial status of each individual. Uh, we cannot base uh, our opinions on uh, their appearance or the clothes that they're wearing. So that makes it very difficult because then we run into the slippery slope of profiling, um, which uh, we, do not, uh, we do not do. I have participated in this initiative myself. I do spend time on the road with uh, my special constables and my transit fare enforcement officers. 
And I can tell you that this enforcement initiative is a deterrent. It is what we need to bring the system into compliance. That deterrent alone will allow for the lessening of further activities, criminal activities, provincial offense activities. You do one thing, you know you can get away with it, why not do something else? So yes, education is the beginning of it. Uh, and our first piece of initiatives is normally an education piece where we take a time period to give warnings and educate people on it. So thank you. Okay, so I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I mean, with every interaction that you're having with someone who is evading a fare, if you were to offer them resources, I'm not sure that would be profiling if you just treated everyone equally who evaded a fare in case they didn't know what their options were. I think that would be reasonable. Um, yeah, I think I think generally, you know, not having the uh, a robust data system about what we're seeing in the field, uh, it is hard to understand uh, what the implications are for this type of program. Uh, so I wonder, with respect to, you know, what, when when do you imagine that that those types of uh, data curiosities will be next reported back to this commission? Mr. Chair, we're uh, looking at this time at the potential of a uh, Transit Commission meeting in May 2024. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, great, Mr. Ch Chair. Just a quick point of order. Uh, since my name was used uh, by the member, I just would like to respond. Quickly, yes. Thank you. Uh, and just to be very clear, I think I did indicate in my remarks that this is more than just fair evasion and having boots and, and badges on platforms. I also mentioned we probably shouldn't talk about other members directly. And I said we're entitled to our own opinions. We've talked about a lot of other things, trying to find some free fare. People are entitled around this table to exercise what they think, and obviously the chair can reel them back in. But I think my points were made very clear. This is not strictly fair evasion. It's also about the safety and security of the people that are on our express systems and our bus systems. Thank you. Councillor Carp. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thanks for letting me have a quick round two. Um, I'm glad it came back on the end. I found it very interesting. I think the demographic data will be extremely interesting. I think most people know I was in the Federal Public Service for over 20 years, and I cannot tell you how many conversations I have heard on office floors over the years about, did you pay your fare this morning? Did you pay your fare this morning? How do you get on the bus? It was rampant in the Federal Public Service to not pay your fare. And I, every single department I worked at, I heard those comments. So I will not make any comment on who's being targeted. I believe it is probably all over the, all over the system. And I certainly have heard from bus operators who have called my office, who, who I maybe live in my ward, or maybe they're calling me because I'm on Transit Commission, who have talked about how stressful this is for them. And Thank you to Councillor Curry for mentioning the fact that we had that separate briefing for program and service review where we heard the concerns of the bus drivers directly on how stressful it is for them to feel that, that they have this issue. So I am uh, absolutely interested in that demographic data. I would never want us to be targeting vulnerable people. I will happily continue to increase and make more fare, fares free for the most vulnerable residents. I, that's a, a priority for me. Um, but I do have a couple questions. So at that meeting that Councillor Curry and I were at, we heard loud and clear that one of the biggest issues that the bus operators felt was the use of the back door on those shorter buses, so not the articulated ones where there's a, uh, there's a name for it, swiper. Um, is that, and, and that, um, that really only came into effect, I believe, when they started opening the back door, when the LRT came into place and there was a longer walk, was there? I'm, I wasn't sure I understood all the details, but is that the policy to have that back door of the shorter buses open um, in order to reduce the, the amount of time that people have to run? Is it Thank, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the question, Chair. So um, it's a good question because we talk about the on-time performance earlier, and this is exactly what we're trying to do. It's to reduce uh, the time to embark, so by uh, opening all doors. But we want people to go, even if they don't have the tap, uh, they can go in front. And 
uh, at the transit way, it's a good example where we open all doors because, you know, normally you should have paid your fare before to, to, to be at this uh, location. But unfortunately, what we see with uh, those exercises, it's, uh, it's unfortunate people don't want to pay because probably, and as you just said, and I'm, I'm sad to hear that, but, uh, you know, people don't care because maybe they think we don't care. Yes, we do care, so we, and that's why we are doing that, and we'll continue to do it. And, and I, I want to say as well that uh, one of the things that uh, Paul Tributata uh, said is the, the number of injuries related to that, because the bus drivers, they don't want to see that. They, they hear us that we're struggling with money. We are asking money to the province, to the feds, etc., to help us. So I think we have to help us first, then people will help us. Yeah, so do you hear frequently from bus drivers who talk about this situation? Like, is this something that comes up in management meetings where they've expressed that within the, the management structure of OC Transpo? Chair, yes. And that's why even before the, the, the president of the union came here uh, last uh, in December, I have asked my team to, to do something because I heard I have heard a lot from the bus drivers, even myself, when I go to see them and speak with them, they used to tell me, hey, Renee, do something, because there was a lot of people who don't pay. And, you know, in Montreal is the same thing. So there is something after the COVID, something, something has happened. We don't know why, we don't know, we don't know the reason, but there is something and it's worse now. This is a fact. So. Yeah, so obviously it's very difficult. You're balancing the needs of those workers against, you know, making sure that we're protecting the most vulnerable with transit fares. Very difficult question. I had a, a small question I missed on the, um, in the beginning. When we were talking about the charges that were presented, and I'm sorry, I don't have my presentation up in front of me, I think there was uh, 114 charges of fare evasion and 64 other charges that were issued by the special constables. I just wanted to confirm of those 64 charges, were some of them, there was multiple offenses by one, by one person? It's not 64 individual charges, was it? I just wanted to confirm that data. So the uh, 64 charges that were um, laid by the special constable unit uh, some of these charges uh, can be multiple charges under different acts for one individual person. Okay, that's what I, that's what I assumed. Okay, thanks very much, and I really look forward to receiving that uh, demographic data so we can have an, an informed discussion and um, really understand how we can better improve our programs and not hurt the most vulnerable, but at the same time ensure our drivers are protected. Thank you very much. Councillor Lieber. Thanks. I just wanted to make sure it was uh, clear. I, I'm not suggesting that OC Transpo itself uh, are the ones who would do the kind of data gathering that I think would need to inform an approach to fair enforcement. Uh, it's probably an academic study uh, at the end of the day. Um, clearly, Chief McRae, you can't ask people as you're handing them a ticket, what is your household income? Uh, and I just want to make sure that that is, is, is very clear. Um, there are ways of getting at that information I don't think those are available to OC Transpo staff. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions? Um, wanted to share a very simple piece of feedback I had from a resident. I'm paraphrasing, but when they heard news reports about this report coming up, they said, it's about time. I pay my fare when I get on the bus. The person next to me should be paying their fare too. And I think uh, Madame Amilcar uh, expressed it, and uh, Chief McRae as well. Um, paying a fare is a fundamental part of using transit. And if we don't show attention to enforcing fare payment, it's a slippery slope down to all of the other points of courtesy and safety and respect that we expect of, of riders and of staff and, and of everyone who's involved in public transit. And it's incredibly important beyond any, uh, beyond any money that might be collected by fares to ensure that people have confidence in the safety and security and people have respect towards each other when they're using public transit. I think it was a good discussion and some issues and concerns raised. That's reasonable, but uh, I, I hope uh, this helps put the message out there to riders that we do care about compliance when it comes to fares and people can expect to see a, a, 
an inspector or a constable or both, and uh, there's a consequence if you don't pay your fare on OC Transpo. So we need to carry this report. So is this report carried or received rather? Received, received, okay, thank you. Thank you to staff. Um, that's the end of our regular items. We have no in-camera items. Are there any notices of motion? I know we have one inquiry from Councillor Plant. Councillor, if you're still with us online, you are welcome to read in that inquiry, and I think the Vice Chair will formally put her name on it on your behalf. Oui, bonjour, salut tout le monde, j'espère que vous allez bien. Um, so Hope everyone is doing well. Things we've gotten uh, a lot of questions on, uh, especially is from our local paratranspo users. Um, C'est pas un secret, uh, les usagers du paratranspo me tiennent beaucoup à so cœur. So, user para, uh, paratranspo users are dear to my heart. We have many in my writing. There are also some that do not have posted paratranspo stops are there and where are they? A list of locations or on a map would be helpful. Where is this information available to the public? What is the policy documented operational practice for snow clearing at posted paratranspo stops? And is the stated policy that they do not clear the stops? Where is it written? What policy is it? What is the policy documented operational practice for clearing regular bus stops for comparison? What is the rationale for the policies in question two and three? And how are the different posted paratranspo stops treated differently, such as if they're on private property, city property, CCOC, NCC, et cetera? Um, alors, merci beaucoup. Uh, J'imagine, est-ce que la réponse okay. va être so, um, à la prochaine rencontre? Are we going to answer this at the next meeting? I just want to know about the timeline. Uh, I think staff would have a look at that request and determine how long it would take. I think the approach is always to answer inquiries as quickly as possible, unless there's additional research and work involved. But staff's preliminary look, is that something you can answer? Absolutely, Chair. We should be able to come back at the next TC. Okay, Merci thank beaucoup. you. Okay, uh, any other business? I don't think so. Uh, then we are adjourned. Thank you, uh, thank you to staff. Thank you to everyone from the clerk's office. It was a long meeting. Uh, our next meeting is Tuesday, March 18th, a little bit different because of a March break. Have a great afternoon. Merci. Thank you.